Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is going to make you angry. It's going to make your blood boil because what happened should have never happened. It should have never gone the way that it did and we will see just how badly this child was failed and it's devastating. It's a truly, truly devastating case and I don't typically cover these types of cases because of how hard they are to talk about, but at the same time, these cases still need to be discussed because of how disturbing they truly are. So without any further delay, let's just get into the case because there is a lot to discuss here. Eli Hart was born to Tori Hart and Jalissa Thaler. Eli was described by those who knew him as the sweetest kid who was kind, compassionate, and loving. Everyone who met the six-year-old little boy immediately fell in love with him. He was always happy, full of energy, full of questions, talkative, and was very inquisitive. He loved to play with matchbox cars and was just recently learning how to fish. Eli loved to sit on his dad's shoulders, wanting to be up there whenever he could. Others described that there was just this special bond between Tori and Eli where you knew that they just belonged together. Eli was born with Towns Brock syndrome, which is a rare genetic disorder that affects several different parts of the body. It can lead to kidney issues, mild to severe hearing loss, eye abnormalities, heart defects, foot abnormalities, and genital malformations. The effects of this disorder vary greatly from person to person, and about 10% of those with this condition have reported a mild learning disability as well. Some people with the disorder may suffer greatly from the symptoms, but most people will go on to live a normal, fulfilled life with a normal life expectancy. Because of his condition, Eli wore hearing aids, he had flat feet, and some of his toes overlapped, and he had to go to regular checkups throughout his entire life to monitor the progression of his disability. But no matter what difficulties he faced, nothing stopped him from being the happy, energetic boy that he always was. He loved blowing bubbles, swinging on the swings at the park, and every Tuesday night, Eli and Tori would go to Carbone's Pizzeria and Eli would get a giant plate of meatballs, which he loved. Eli had also just been recently learning how to fish with his dad. Tori said that he originally got Eli a small fishing pole, but instead he insisted on using his dad's bigger one. So he tried it and he got it down on his first cast. He caught more fish than Tori did. He was a natural. Eli attended Shirley Killey Primary School in Mound, Minnesota. There he was popular with the other kids. He loved being social with the other children. He loved talking and playing with the other kids. He was very outgoing and he had tons of friends who adored him. Eli loved seeing fire trucks and he had dreams of someday becoming a firefighter. The relationship between Eli's parents, Tori and Julissa, was a tumultuous one. Julissa herself had a pretty rough history from the very start. According to court records, Jalissa started to use alcohol at the age of 13 and she had misused prescription Adderall since the age of 14 and at the same age, she started smoking weed. Then by 16, she started to abuse opioids. By 20, she started using benzodiazepines and by 21, she began using LSD on almost a daily basis. During this time, she was also diagnosed with two personality disorders as well as substance abuse disorder. I'm not exactly sure how long Jalissa and Tori were together or if they were ever actually together before having Eli or after having him. But what we do know is that Jalissa's mental health and drug abuse did not improve after Eli was born. When Eli was only a year and a half old, Child Protective Services got a report that Jalissa had been delusional and despondent. When they responded, they found that Jalissa was paranoid that a bug was trying to attack her son. But after having this episode, she did agree to get treatment for her mental health. So, CPS closed the case. After that, Jalissa would start accusing Tori of abusing her, trying to do everything that she could to try to get Tori away from her and Eli. In 2019, she accused Tori of planting a bomb in her car. When investigating this, police found a water bottle full of nails, 
but this was enough for Jalissa to be granted a restraining order against Tori, which made it so that he could not contact her again. But then because of this, she was also granted sole custody of Eli. By 2020 through 2021, Jalissa suffered several more mental breakdowns, leaving Eli to suffer with the consequences. In October of 2020, law enforcement was called to her resident after she got locked out of her own place. When they got there, they found that she appeared to be unstable, so they questioned her ability to take care of her son. They took Jalissa into the hospital and placed her on a 72-hour hold after finding that she was in a state of delusion at the time. Then, when the officers entered the home to look around, at this time, they found that there were raw eggs broken and smeared all throughout the floor. There was food all around the main floor that was in various states of rotting. There had been a fence that was disassembled and just sitting there lying on the kitchen floor. The home was an absolute mess and filled with clutter. And the officer noted that he couldn't even find Eli's clothes or his shoes, and he was naked when police arrived. Then, in early 2021, police responded to yet another call. This time, Jalissa was found to be having paranoid delusions and hallucinations. She said that she was hearing voices that were telling her to kill herself. When police arrived, they found that Eli, once again, was in a state of neglect. Eli, at the time, had been covered in cuts, his hair was matted, and he didn't have his hearing aids. Finally, after this call, the state took five-year-old Eli away from the home and placed him into foster care. By January of 2021, Eli was placed into the care of Jalissa's cousin, Stephen Kronberg, and his wife, Nikita. Once again, at this home, Eli stayed true to himself. His caregivers reported that despite his struggles and seeing his mom go through these mental breakdowns and being neglected, living in horrific conditions, he was still this sweet, energetic, loving little boy. During the time that Eli was staying with this family, obviously Jalissa needed to work to get better so that she could be deemed mentally healthy enough to care for her young son. She needed to get mental health treatment, be able to provide a clean and stable home environment, and she needed to prove that she could be clean of the drugs. During this time, Tori was also trying to get custody of Eli, but the state wouldn't consider him for housing at that time. He too had to undergo parenting evaluations, mental health check-ins, and drug tests. None of these tests ever came back with any concerns, but still, even through all of it, it seemed that even if Tori did nothing wrong and he was working to better himself, he still was not allowed custody. Over the year that followed, Jalissa did everything in her power to try to get Eli back and to prevent Tori from having custody of him in any way that she could. She would constantly tell authorities and her caseworkers that Tori was trying to hurt her and Eli. But at the same time, she was arrested for stealing drugs from a health clinic and she tested positive for drugs such as methadone and Oxycontin. It was found that she had moved four different times within the span of four months because she was kicked out of all of these different places by the landlords for being disruptive. Police were called to her residences 21 times within 10 months due to her disruptive behaviors. She also wasn't showing up to court-mandated health treatment, completely stopping treatment by October of 2021, and she was actually kicked out of her parenting class that she was in due to her disruptive behavior. Also throughout the entire year, Jalissa continued to make allegations of abuse against Tori, but throughout this time, while he was in foster care, both Jalissa and Tori were visiting with Eli, and during that time, a pattern started to emerge. First, Eli would tell the caseworkers that Jalissa was not happy. He told them that Jalissa told him, Eli, that she was surviving off of Mountain Dew and cigarettes. He said that his mom is sad and lonely and that it just isn't fair for her, that she can't sleep, she can't eat because of how sad and lonely she is. So she's telling all of this to her 
five or six year old little boy that she's sad, she's not eating, she's not sleeping because she's lonely. Sounds like a her problem, not for her child. Then during another visit, Jalissa dug her fingernails into a social services staff's hand and then threw garbage at her. Then in a visit a week after that, the same social worker said that Jalissa straight up ignored Eli for hours at a time and just appeared to be completely zoned out. In that case, the social worker said that Eli was playing with a toy and he was begging his mom to help him because the toy wasn't working. He kept asking Jalissa louder and louder to help, but his mom just straight up did not respond to him. She was just staring straight ahead, not even acknowledging that he was there. Then, after several minutes, she finally helped him with the toy and then just went back off staring into space again. Meanwhile, during the visits with Tori, Eli seemed happy. He was seeming to grow a very special bond with his father. Eli mentioned nothing to the caseworkers about any sort of abuse or neglect or anything that could point towards him being abusive or anything towards him or Jalissa. The caseworker knew at that time that Jalissa had just been making up all of these different allegations against Tori. Now, in Minnesota, when it comes to these custody battles and foster care and all of that, the parents basically have a year to get back on track for the return of their child, or they will be placed into another home permanently. So, by November of 2021, it seemed that Jalissa was finally just starting to clean up her act and was starting to meet parts of the plan. During the time before this, she only had supervised visits, so now she was starting to have unsupervised visits with Eli, and during these visits, she always picked him up on time. She made it to Eli's therapy appointments on time and would always drop him back off at his foster parents' home in time as well. She restarted drug testing and apparently tested negative during this entire time. Now, the caseworker assigned to Eli's case, a woman named Beth Denner, felt that even though she was doing better at the time, she might not keep these behaviors up. But because of her progress, I guess Beth felt that it was appropriate to at least trial an unsupervised home visit, so meaning he would live with her for a couple weeks at a time, while obviously the foster parents continued to have custody. When hearing this decision, obviously other people in Eli's life were very concerned. Tori and the foster parents emailed with Beth expressing their concern for Eli's well-being. In part, the email reads, we are just going to forget every single bad thing that she's done these last 10 months. I guess there's not much I can do but keep my doors open for him when he will return because everyone in the family sees him returning to foster care if he is returned to her. So Beth said that she basically warned Jalissa that if things didn't go well with the home visit, that they were going to place Eli with Tori and file for a transfer of custody. When pondering this idea, Beth had emailed with Assistant District Attorney Jennifer Jackson asking basically what are the requirements for them to end a trial home visit and transfer custody. In the email, Jennifer Jackson replied saying that the home visit may end, quote, in order to protect the child's health, safety, or welfare. It does not need to rise to the level of endangerment, so she continued by saying, if mom shows she cannot consistently meet his needs by missing appointments, school, etc., then we will consider ending the trial home visit. We can also consider ending the trial home visit if mom does not make her appointments and it directly affects Eli's health, safety, or welfare. And I do like a backup plan with dad. So, the judge signed off on this trial home visit, which was set to start on December 22nd, which was a few weeks out at that point, and it would be during his school break so that Eli wouldn't have to miss school. During the time before the trial home visit, though, Eli was allowed overnight visits with his mom. But after one of these overnight visits, Jalissa was driving dangerously over 20 miles over the speed limit when she was dropping Eli back off at the foster home. This, of course, really scared Eli and he was sobbing as he got out of the car with his mom. So because of this incident, Stephen emailed the caseworker, Beth, saying again, quote, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the decision to do this home trial. 
the reason Eli was taken from the home was due to mom's mental health and her mental health has not improved at all. If anything, I would say it has declined. Then on another night, Stephen woke up at around 3 a.m. to find that Jalissa and her roommate had driven to the home, parked outside, and were watching the home with binoculars. They had been sitting there for hours just watching the house. So, Stephen called 911 and tried to go outside to confront Jalissa, but just as he got out of the car, she drove off. Once again, Nikita, Stephen's wife, emailed Beth Denner saying that she was scared for her family's safety. Beth replied saying that she would get the family a restraining order banning her from having contact with them, but apparently these behaviors did not raise a red flag for Jalissa being mentally unwell in general. Beth still felt that Eli was fit to go home with his mother. And rather than punishing Jalissa for this outrageous behavior, Beth decided that what the best course of action was, was to send Eli home with Jalissa two days early. So, she emailed Eli's school saying, quote, I was made aware of some issues that occurred last night and this morning, and I know that Eli's mom called the school to see if he was going to be there this morning. We have made the decision to have Eli move back with his mom two days early after what occurred last night. I have told her that she is responsible for bringing him to and from school tomorrow and Wednesday. She will be picking him up at three tonight for his usual Monday therapy session. So, instead of punishing Jalissa for her behavior, she punished Eli, sending him home with his mother, who is clearly not mentally fit to take care of him. And even within days of the visit, she couldn't even act on her best behavior. The literal first day that Eli was sent home with his mom, CPS got an email from the school which said that Jalissa was driving recklessly when she dropped off and picked up Eli. In the email, one school staff member wrote, quote, Another teacher in sixth grade watched Jalissa come pick up Eli and she said that the way mom pulled in, the amount of speed and recklessness that she was driving gave her a huge pit in her stomach and made it hard for her to feel comfortable sending Eli off with mom. Teachers who don't know Eli or his story are all addressing large concerns. Then, 10 days later, by December 30th, the court-appointed guardian wrote to Child Protective Services to say that they need to end the trial home visit. By that time, the Guardian knew about Jalissa stalking the foster family, and she also said that Jalissa was calling repeatedly to try to get the visits with Eli's father canceled. Then, when the visits between Eli and his father were not canceled, Jalissa filed for yet another order of protection against Tori, saying that he was physically abusing her and Eli. When emailing with the caseworkers, the Guardian wrote, quote, I feel like we need to vacate the trial home visit as she doesn't appear stable to me and this is putting Eli at risk. These are the same concerns regarding her mental health that brought this case in and it hasn't improved. The same day, on December 30th, the same day that this email was sent, Beth had another disturbing interaction with Jalissa. Jalissa was on the phone trying to tell Beth about the order of protection that she filed against Tori and Beth told Jalissa that the state didn't have any concerns regarding Tori. When hearing this, though, Jalissa became enraged and hung up with Beth. Then, by January 19th, when another social worker stopped by to drop Eli off after the visit with his father, Jalissa slammed the door in the social worker's face and would not let her look inside of the apartment. This caseworker also emailed with Beth Denner saying, quote, I think Jalissa thinks she has Eli back with no strings attached. Last week, she grabbed my arm and this week when I dropped Eli off, she slammed the door in my face. A few days after this email, on February 2nd, this caseworker emailed Beth again saying, well, it's good to know that Jalissa remains consistent with slamming the door in my face. She opens the door enough so Eli can get in, then slam. She does not want me looking in her apartment, that's for sure. That same month, Jalissa missed even more parenting classes to the point that she was kicked out again by mid-January. Then, CPI realized that Jalissa was lying to them about her mental health program. She emailed CPS saying that she actually graduated her program and no longer needed services, but the program director reached out to CPS as well and told them that this just was not true. 
They also said that they didn't think Jalissa was being truthful with her therapists and that she was always looking for new therapists who didn't know her full story. Even with all of this, even with these emails, these missed appointments, the lies, the reckless driving, all of the other red flags, Beth Denner did not think that there were any issues. In an email, she wrote, Despite the ongoing concerns regarding Miss Thaler's behavior, the county reunified her with her son for a trial home visit on December 20th, 2021. There is no current indication that her son is physically unsafe in her care. She has regularly brought Eli to doctor's appointments and weekly therapy. Then, Beth decided that after two months of regular drug screening, she took her off of the random drug screens. So I guess two months off after years and years and years and years and years and years of drug abuse is long enough to prove that she's good. And after missing her literal drug appointments and therapy appointments, she's fine. Two months clean. You're good. You're good to go, according to Beth. By February, Eli's behaviors started to change. His teachers began to notice that this one happy, sweet, energetic, loving young boy started to become aggressive, and he even lashed out and punched another boy at school. The teacher was concerned, so she emailed Beth with the concern. She wrote, quote, I asked each student to give me an example of someone being mean to them on the playground or in school. Eli proceeded to tell me that his mom pushes him. Other students seemed shocked by this example. We then discussed the importance of telling a trusted adult like a teacher or a principal if an adult is hurting you. To this, Beth responded, I appreciate the update and it's interesting that he would make that statement. It's not something that CPS would take as maltreatment report to assess, unfortunately. However, I do want you to keep documenting everything. That same month, Eli's therapist emailed Beth to let her know that Jalissa had become confrontational with the therapist and when that happened, Eli became scared and hid in the cabinet from his mother. Then in early March, there was yet another report from Eli's school. In this email, it was said that Eli told the teacher, my mom is hurting me. The teacher asked what she was doing, to which Eli said that she grabbed his wrists and squeezed him hard. There is no record of any response, so it seemed that CPS did nothing. By that same month in March, Tori filed for custody of his son. After he did that, of course, Jalissa filed for another order of protection against Tori. She was saying the same accusations that Beth and other CPS workers had acknowledged they believed were false. After this, Beth wrote to Jennifer Jackson saying, she's so mentally ill. Ugh, I think the second we close, it's just going to be report after report of false abuse allegations. She's starting the process already. Yet still, Beth and Jennifer still requested to a judge that they close the case. Beth Denner wrote to the judge, quote, the kid has been going to school. She cooperated with a visit for dad last weekend. Kiddo is still going to therapy. That's basically what she's required to do at this point. Eli's court-appointed guardian emailed Beth Denner saying, quote, I'm submitting a report that will say my concerns about closing the case yet, realizing that the concerns don't rise to the level of child protection matter. Then it will be up to the judge to decide. I just can't say right out to close it without going on record expressing these concerns regarding how she's impacting his mental health. Then they ended up having a hearing on March 30th for custody and at the hearing, Eli's legal guardian told the courts that Jalissa was attempting to isolate Eli that she was trying to prevent him from having any visitation with his father, and that she was filing these false abuse allegations. She stated straight out that Eli is not safe in his mother's care. The judge acknowledged that Jalissa was doing everything in her power to prevent Tori from having visitation or parenting time. He stated that he is concerned with her behaviors here, and he denied CPS's request to close the case, then he scheduled another hearing for May. Now, I guess in Minnesota, when there is a child protection case open, the state won't look into custody requests from parents. So because of this, the state put Tori's custody request on hold until the protection case was closed. So during this time, the state only considers whether or not Eli is safe to return home with Jalissa, not necessarily who the best parent is. So at that point, some people were trying to say that they should get the case closed just so they can start the process of trying to get Eli with his father. After that, before the next hearing, it seemed that Beth Denner was just getting really tired of dealing with Jalissa. And to me, 
I think she was tired of it a long time ago. The fact that Beth knew how mentally unstable Jalissa was, yet she said that she's still meeting the requirements for having Eli, that says to me that she just wanted the case to be over so that she could stop dealing with it. Either way, in an email, Beth told another staff member that when she comes to pick Eli up from Jalissa, that she's just going to throw a fit. So, another staff member named Amy agreed to pick Eli up. When she picked him up, she said that Eli had dark circles under his eyes. He looked dirty, and he looked like he hadn't showered in days. Eli told Amy that he had been up the entire night before, that he had been driving around in the car all night with his mom. The same day that Amy was picking Eli up, Josie, Tori's then girlfriend, texted Amy and asked her if she had picked up Eli. The texts are as follows. Hi, this is Josie. Were you able to pick him up? Amy said, I've got him in my car. I'm about to leave their apartment, so I'll be in Hudson in an hour. Josie said, thank you. Amy said, they pulled up in a car. Eli said they were driving around all night. Josie said, I bet she lost her apartment. You'll report that to Beth, right? Amy said, definitely. Josie said, I parked by the welcome sign for McDonald's. I do have to run in and use the restroom quickly in case I'm not in the car. Amy said, okay, we just pulled in two. Josie said, any chance she told you when the last time she gave him his medicine was or what she gave him? Amy said, no, she didn't say. I'm assuming you're talking about the Tylenol. She just stated that if he gets a fever to give him some. I'm going to assume she hadn't given him any unless Eli said differently. She seemed so disorganized and disheveled. It took her a bit to gather up what few things from her car that I gave you. I've never seen Eli look this way before. I can call or text her if you'd like and ask. Josie said, I haven't either. And she said, no, it's fine. I was just wondering what she was giving him. He just seemed out of it a little himself. Not sure if it's because she gave him cough medicine or something or he's really tired. I'm just not sure. He doesn't have a fever or complaints, so I'm not planning on giving him anything anytime soon. Amy said, I'm sure if they've been sleeping in her car for a few nights or driving around as Eli said, it could have just been pure exhaustion from that. I can't imagine what she's putting that child through right now. Also, God knows what she may have given him. I sent Beth Denner and the GAL an email if what I saw this morning and what Eli reported to me. Josie said, this whole situation breaks my heart for Eli and Tori. Thank you. We won't quit fighting for Eli. Amy said, breaks my heart too. He deserves a good life with the two of you. I will do anything I can to help you guys. Josie said, I just don't understand why this has gone on so long. Laws need to change. Amy said, I believe Beth, the social worker, didn't want to deal with Jalissa. I believe Eli should have gone to Tory last fall. Unfortunately, I didn't get a say in that. Some workers are just lazy. Beth B and I have tried to get Beth D to see what Jalissa has done and how awful she is, but she seems to look the other way. It's very sad. Josie said, something has to happen soon for Eli. Amy said, I wholeheartedly agree. I hope he feels good enough to have a good weekend. Josie said, he seems fine now. He slept the whole drive, so I'm guessing he was exhausted. Truthfully, we just want this Chips case to close so we can deal with custody and family court, where somebody will actually do what's best for Eli. Amy said, that's probably what's best at this point, since the powers that be on the Chips side aren't doing anything. I'm praying that Tori can finally get custody once the case moves to family court. Literally, how infuriating is that? That other social workers who know Beth and interact with her are literally saying that she's just lazy and doesn't want to deal with her. Mm, it makes you so mad. Either way, after this conversation, Amy emailed Beth and Eli's guardian saying, quote, Eli reported to me this morning that he and mom had spent the night driving around. When I questioned it and asked him about it, he told me that they did not sleep at the apartment, but that they were just driving around all night. Neither the guardian nor Beth informed the courts of this new information. The two of them had filed a request to close the case together, and by May 10th, the case was closed by a judge. So, it does seem at this point that people did want the case closed so that family courts could deal with it, but it seemed that the courts were just dragging their feet on all of this because by May 20th, 10 days after the case had closed and five months into the trial home visit, everything came to a head. It seems that 10 days is a long time for him to stay in her custody. So I don't know what was happening with the courts, but clearly it took a long time. But on this day, May 20th, police were conducting a routine traffic stop to a Chevrolet Impala that they found driving with one of the front tires missing. It was just driving on the right rim of the car. 
So, when the officers stopped the car, they found that Jalissa was the one driving. At this point, she was clearly disheveled and she was acting abnormally. Officers noted that not only was the front tire of the car missing, but the back window of the car was broken as well and there appeared to be blood on Jalissa's hand, face, and in her hair. And then officers also noted a shotgun shell as well as a spent shell casing in the car. Then they noticed what looked to be blood inside of the car and a bullet hole in the back seat. When she was asked about the blood on her body, she told the officers that all of that blood was there from removing a tampon. Then when officers pressed her about what was all over the back seat, she said that she had just purchased deer meat from an unknown butcher overnight and then returned to see her AA sponsor that next morning. None of it makes sense. But either way, due to the state of the car, the police felt that they had reasonable suspicion to search the car and obviously determined that it was not safe to drive. So officers tried to have Jalissa detained while they searched the car, but she became impatient and uncooperative and she refused to sit in the back of the police car. So they sent her home while they took in the car to search it. And upon searching the trunk of the car, police found the body of a young boy who had been shot to death along with a blanket and a shotgun that was also in the trunk of the car. Then in the back seat of the car, they found more blood and what appeared to be brain matter all throughout the back seat of the car. So when police went to Jalissa's apartment, of course, by the time they got there, she was gone. So, police entered her home and found that the washing machine was running and in that washing machine, police found the clothes that Jalissa had been wearing at the time of the traffic stop. At that point, police knew that she had to be on foot. They found surveillance video from her apartment which showed her leaving the apartment with her boyfriend while carrying a backpack with her. So, they were able to quickly track her down and they stopped her and arrested her. When they found her on foot, she appeared to have blood and what looked like brain matter in her hair. After questioning some witnesses in that area, one citizen reported seeing Jalissa and her car stop at a gas station right before this traffic stop and it said that it looked like she was parked near the dumpsters. So, police went and searched in that dumpster that was at the gas station and inside they found a backpack, blood, bones, and what appeared to be brain matter all in that dumpster. From that dumpster, police were able to track the movements of the car using the tracks that the damage from the rim, from driving on the rim of the car, left on the road. It literally left tracks for where she went. After driving the car, officers found several different areas where they found blood and brain matter discarded in different trash cans and dumpsters. In one dumpster, police found a child booster seat that was covered in blood and it looked like the booster seat had sustained considerable damage, which appeared to be consistent with a blast from a shotgun. After that, police went ahead and questioned a close friend of Jalissa's. This friend told the officers that within the past week, Jalissa had suddenly become interested in learning how to use a gun. So, Jalissa went to the store to purchase a shotgun and over the next two days, they went to the gun range together. Then, a witness at the local sporting goods store reported to the police that on May 19th, Jalissa had been asking employees for shells that would blow the biggest hole into something. Then, she bought 40 rounds of this shotgun ammunition. Then, of course, after finding the body in the trunk of the car, the body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. And, of course, it was confirmed that the body belonged to sweet, loving, energetic, adorable six-year-old Eli Hart. The autopsy found that Eli had been shot to his head and torso many times, up to nine times. He had been shot nine times. 
Of course, it was clear that Jalissa was the one who shot her six-year-old child nine times and murdered him. So, she was arrested and charged with second-degree murder, and she was taken into custody as police continued their investigation. However, as police continued their investigation, they found evidence that this was actually a clearly planned premeditated murder. Upon searching Jalissa's internet search history, police found several searches of interest. These included how to keep a child away from another parent with visitation, how to fake AM insurance claim, car damage, does a doctor's note prevent a child from parent visitation, how to fake being home to the cops, most powerful knockout drug, how much whiskey to give a baby, how much blood can a six-year-old lose, qualifying accidental deaths, most expensive life insurance for child, how much does life insurance pay for dead child, how to keep a child home from school for a month, child life insurance policy, qualifying accidental deaths, does life insurance cover drowning, how to commit crime and blame child, what length is allowed to saw off a shotgun barrel, direction to gun clubs shooting ranges, child term life insurance, life insurance with no income, how life insurance investigates a death claim, can you take out multiple policies on someone? So, these are all of the internet searches that she made, it also turned out that Jalissa attempted to take out five different life insurance policies in Eli's name. With all of the evidence that we discussed earlier with the custody battles, the struggles with drugs and mental health, the clear evidence of abuse and neglect, the blood, gun, and the body in the car, the Google searches, everything put together, Clearly, this was first-degree premeditated murder. So, the trial for murder started in February of 2023, and Jalissa was being charged with first-degree murder. Of course, the prosecution basically argued that there was a financial motive for the murder, as well as simply trying to keep Eli away from his father for the simple reason of her being a vindictive piece of human garbage. They didn't say that. I'm saying that, but they might as well have said that. The defense basically just said that she didn't murder her son, that she loved her son, and that she had absolutely no reason to murder him. They talked about how Jalissa was planning a future with Eli, that she even planned to take him to Disneyland soon. Oh my goodness, Disneyland. She could not have done it. They were going to Disney soon. When asked about the Google searches, the defense tried to claim that she was actually trying to get Eli to donate his blood to the Red Cross, which could explain the question about how much blood a six-year-old can lose as if the Red Cross doesn't know that when he goes to donate. She needs to make sure they don't take all of his blood. But honestly, I don't think they have much of an explanation for anything else. The defense basically said, yeah, Jalissa is guilty of something. Something but not what she's being charged with. Eli's father took the stand to talk about how much Eli meant to him that all Jalissa tried to do was take his son away from her for absolutely no reason, that any time he tried to get custody, which he tried so hard to do, she would just file an order of protection against him to delay any and all hearings. And after the case was finally closed and maybe he would finally be considered for custody, she took the first chance that she got to murder her son in the most horrific and brutal way imaginable. The one person that this child should absolutely trust the most, she ripped his life away from him by shooting him over and 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 over. Was that annoying? Because that was nine times. That was as many times as she shot her son. Nine times. One giant shot at close range wasn't enough. She needed to obliterate the six-year-old little baby nine times. She wanted to know what can shoot the biggest hole in something and that wasn't enough. She needed to do it eight more times after that. That's what she did to her son. So, at the end of the trial, just recently by May 20th of 2023, the jury went off for their deliberations and of course, they found Jalissa guilty in the first-degree murder of Eli Hart. After sentencing, multiple family members took the stand to talk about just how much this death has affected them, how CPS had failed them so many times, and they did so as Jalissa sat there wiping her tears away as if she felt bad for any of this. Um, or would you rather not be reported? Whatever you wish is what we'll respect. Uh, I allow it. Allow it, okay. All right. With that, I'll turn it to the two of you. However, you'd like to present it. Your Honor, everyone knows Eli Hart as the victim of this senseless and horrific crime. But Eli was so much more. Eli was an amazing six-year-old boy 
who always woke up full of energy and laughter. He was kind, made friends easily, loved reading books. Eli had a love for animals that was very special. Eli explored, played outside, fished with his dad. Eli was an innocent, loving six-year-old boy. He did not deserve this. Eli deserved to grow up and have a safe and happy life. We know these things about Eli because he was our little boy, our son, the center of our world, the love and connection he had with his son, that Tori had with his only son, was something I was privileged to see. You could see the love and bond they shared every second they were together. They had this extra spark between them that everyone could see. Now we only have memories. Time was taken from us, a lifetime of memories to be made gone, a lifetime without Eli robbed of us. School milestones that we will never get to see like graduating kindergarten and elementary school, all the artwork he would have brought home and put on the fridge, taken. The first day of middle school and high school, prom, graduation, watch him play sports, teach him to drive, stolen from us. Watching Eli grow and become a young man and what he could have been and done in this world. We will never have those memories. No more hugs, no more snuggles. They were ripped from us. You can't explain the loss of your only son. You can't explain what that does to you or anyone. Then, having lost him in such a horrific way, you just ex can't explain how that changes your life. How the pain is so deep you can't breathe. How nothing in your life looks or feels the same. And no one understands. Your lack of sleep at night, the nightmares of how Eli was murdered. The struggle to go to work every day knowing Eli has no more days. How painful it is that life just keeps moving and doesn't slow down for us to grieve. No one should ever have to feel this kind of pain or experience, this kind of trauma. But we have been sentenced to a lifetime of this pain, confusion, grief, sorrow, and trauma. A lifetime without Eli. The little boy who would laugh and giggle and squeal so hard when he and his dad would play at the park. It's a sound I hope never fades from our memory. The little boy who rescued the... Okay, just a second, I'm sorry. The little boy who rescued a baby panfish who was stuck in the shore when he was fishing with his dad. He was so proud. He came running in to tell me all about it, but couldn't get his words out because he was so excited. He was so proud. The little boy that loved being on his dad's shoulders. The little boy who, when we asked him, who loves you the most, would always reply, you both do. There are no more triple hugs. No more I love you. No more memories to be made. Just emptiness. Eli was a happy six-year-old boy, our little boy that we loved so deeply. At her sentencing hearing, she was given the sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Then she was given a moment to speak after receiving her sentence, and she said, I'm innocent, F you all, you're all garbage. Ms. Scholar, you have a right to speak this morning. If you'd like, you don't have any obligation to speak, but if you'd like to choose to speak, now is the time to do it. Yes, I would like to say something. Go ahead. Um. I'm innocent. Fuck you all. You're garbage. That's all your honor. Miss Scholar, I you know, don't know that that's appropriate here. Um, Sorry, I told you what somebody else can. What I would say is, you know, the worst thing that seems to happen to parents is to lose their child. It's worse, though, when you don't lose your child to something like cancer or an accident. It's when someone takes that child from the world. What I can't imagine, nobody can imagine, is when the person that takes a child from the world is the one that brought that child in. But that is what the jury concluded you did, and I respect the jury's judgment, and I respect Minnesota's decision about what the appropriate consequence is. Nothing I do 
would bring justice to this situation. Nothing I do will relieve any of the pain that you cause by doing that. But what is, according to law, the just and fair sentence for what you did is what Mr. Allard said, and that is life in prison without the possibility of parole. So I will judge you guilty of first degree murder and issue that sentence. I will not um, impose any sentence. I can't hear you over your stomach, probably. I'm sorry. The bottom line is that you are being sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, Ms. Stoller. I'm not going to impose any kind of fine or fees. I will require that you submit a DNA sample. As I mentioned, I'll keep restitution open for 60 days. With that, is there anything else, Mr. Allen, you can cover this morning? No, Your Honor, thank you. Ms. Rapp, I have to give you the opportunity as well. Anything else? No, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Leary? Nothing, Your Honor. Ms. Newton? Nothing, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, everyone, for your hard work in this case. <coughs>
No shame in that. She doesn't deserve to be breathing the same air as anybody else on this earth after what she did to her little boy for literally no reason other than just wanting to keep him away from the dad. And I think that's why she did it. And I think life insurance was like a secondary benefit, but she didn't even get the life insurance. So clearly she just wanted to keep him away from the dad. And it's just, I said I wouldn't rant about this, but here I am. So I'm going to end it there. Heart goes out to Eli and everyone who loved him. This shouldn't have happened. And I will keep you all up to date on if anything else comes of this case in terms of charges or anything else that is done with the workers that were involved in this case. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please send those suggestions to my Google form, which will be listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.